All right, guys, welcome back to this next episode of Phantology. Um, we, ha- we are doing the stand full spoiler review. Um, uh, we have done the non-spoiler review where we talked about just our basic takes from it, or what we liked and disliked. And here we're going to dive deep into um, why we like the things we did and cover plot points and specific character developments, and as well as go over um, comparisons to our modern day. So, yeah. So yeah. full full spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, then go re- listen to our last episode. Yeah. And spoilers for that episode, I gave it a seven <laughs> and a half to eight out of ten. Yeah, and I gave it gave it an eight to eight and a half out of ten. So split the difference there. We we definitely both recommend it as a read. Yeah. And so we're gonna get into our reasons for reading that and specific plot points here. So so stick around for the ride. It's gonna be fun. Yeah. So um, I think the way we'll do this is kind of cover our like core characters. There's a huge cast in the stand. So we'll cover the core characters and what their journey looked like throughout the book and the plot points and everything. Um, and yeah, so let's start with, um, I don't know if you want to start with. Uh, let's start with Harold. Harold. Okay, cool. Her- 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 Harold's, um, I think the most fascinating character from this book. Same. He's, he's my favorite character for sure. Yeah. And, and always with Stephen King, favorite character is a very interesting choice of words because he, um, I feel like he starts sympathetic, but Mm -hmm. then ends in a not very sympathetic place. He like start, like if let's say low is sympathetic, he he like goes like this and he, I guess you can't really see it's podcast, but he, he spikes into this very unsympathetic way. And then at the very end of his journey, that sympathy is there again. I honestly, I had yeah. sympathy for him the whole time, but, but the, yeah. his, his immoral decisions outweighed that obviously for a large portion of the book. But. And, and I, I will say there, there's, there's a hint of like mental illness about Harold. Mental illness is something that Stephen King has in a lot of his characters Mm -hmm. um and it's handled tactfully in some and not tactfully in others but so so there's there's a lot to harold and and i want to get into more specifics but just broad overview there's things about harold where you don't know if it's due to his mental illness you don't know if it's due to like an evil force acting on him and taking away some of his agency Mm -hmm. and then there's just he's just a bad person sometimes he, he has like yeah elements of just being a bad like evil person in him right yeah i'd say i mean he's defined by which is i i assume is like the the mental illness part you're talking about he has this um like inf- inferiority complex kind of thing i don't mm-hmm. know if i'm saying this right but basically like he's a he's a really smart guy but he feels he's never really satisfied his parents' expectations. He was always in the shadow of his older sister and he was very socially awkward, um, overweight, which plays a big deal into his character and feeling insecure. So he has these huge insecurities, but he's also really smart, which makes him like kind of see himself as better than other people, but also always constantly worried about being like inferior to other people at the same time which i think is a common thing in a lot of a lot of people in general but it's taken to the extreme with harold and really defines him yeah i think it's a it's a narrative that we've seen like pop up more and more um especially i feel like harold was a character ahead of his time in a way like um he has kind of like the unabomber type feel to him where he's like you could see him outside of this story obviously being like a recluse somebody who's planning to do like the this terrible like terrible things yeah you know and i feel like that narrative um has become a lot more prominent like within the last 20 years or so or maybe 30 maybe since maybe even more so since columbine you know yeah i feel like stephen king was ahead of his time a little bit on exploring these facets of of this type of character Mm mm-hmm um, yeah, I, I'd agree. Yeah. Um, let's so, yeah. let's get into a little bit more sp- specifics with him. So, the, he and um, Fran, Franny, Fran, what, what, Fran, uh, Franny, Fran, yeah, Franny. I think Fran, yeah, yeah. 
they are kind of the only two survivors that we really know about in their small town. Franny was best friends with Harold's sister and both of their families die and they start their journey together. Yeah. And he, you can tell, I don't know if it's like, it's not like he's always had a crush on her, but definitely, you know, he develops a crush on her. Fran is an attractive um, young woman in the, in the uh, um, story and they're around the same age and they're like the last survivors. So you can tell he's thinking like, Oh, like, we're going to be together. He's kind of romanticizing themselves. Um, and he has, he's really smart. So he has the idea to check out the, the CDC in Virginia, Virginia, or Vermont. I don't know. <laughs> what was it? Atlanta? What, no, cause, no, because they so, weren't going to. The... No, they didn't want to go to the one in Atlanta, but yeah. there's another one nearby. I think it was, must've been Vermont. That's the closest one to, because they were in Maine, I think. I don't know. Um, so he, he has this decision to go there and he writes his, like their names on this barn roof or side of the barn saying, Hey, this is who we are. This is where we're going to meet up with other people. Um, and along the way they meet, uh, Stu Redman and yeah, basically he's, um, and that's another defining moment of his personality where they encounter Stu Redman, this, uh, friendly guy who Harold immediately sees him as a threat because of his jealousy towards Fran. Even though Stu hasn't really come on to Fran or anything, he's just looking to be with people. Um, And it starts this kind of competition with every other Mm -hmm. person he's around. He has to prove him. He feels like he has to prove himself always. And yeah. Yeah. And and something something else about Franny, because we started talking about her, is Mm -hmm. she's pregnant. Um, she was she's a teenage like late teenage she's a senior in high school or something right she was she was in college oh was she in college oh yeah yeah, yeah. Right. okay yeah so anyway um but she's young to be pregnant it's out of wedlock you know and her uh boyfriend that got her pregnant dies in the pandemic you know and yeah. so harold doesn't know though that she's pregnant for the yeah for most of the book um and there, there was one scene that I that I really enjoyed with just how this is how well Stephen King does characters in my opinion was there's a conversation between uh, Fran and her father about the baby about her being pregnant and her father handled it kind of in the way that you would I don't know uh, he he wasn't like super excited about the prospect of his daughter being pregnant but he said that he would support any decision that she made and was like supportive of him her and you really like got this you felt like you knew this father right yeah that that was like his only scene in the book Mm -hmm. he was only in there for maybe a few pages but like you just feel Stephen King has this masterful way of feeling like you he's able to have these characters fully realized and then pour like their essence onto the page even if it's the only scene that they're in in the book yeah yeah he that her whole moments at home were really I don't, I don't know. They were just really good character development uh, for her and her like thought process around the baby. We also get her mom being, her mom has been grief stricken and kind of out of her mind since uh, her older brother, I think passed away. And her mom is like upset that she's pregnant out of wedlock and, and everything, but um, it really helps her just get the resolve to like, no, I'm going to have the baby. She wants the baby now. And um like she's gonna she's gonna be like a strong person and and do things her own way um yeah and you you get this inner strength from fran that like yeah she um she is strong she knows what she wants and she's going to you know not really be pushed around yeah very much and you really get that in in the beginning pages of this book yeah, and her re- her relation with Harold is interesting because you can tell she cares for Harold, like mm-hmm. as as a person, um, but she's also frustrated by him, and this comes into play with her diary and everything. But so she lo- she likes him and loves him as a person, not romantically. She can tell he's interested romantically, so she has to constantly play this kind of defense of not letting him get too close because she's not interested that way but also like they need to stick together and and so she starts to uh, because of the baby she starts to write in a diary um what's going on so the baby has a record of the pandemic and everything and uh and 
yeah, and she she pours out her frustrations of, and also her admirations of Harold as well, but it's constantly back and forth with that. Um, but basically Harold's journey with Fran um, is this culmination of him trying to prove himself and prove he's worthy of her. And then she being frustrated by his arrogance and pride and his social awkwardness. And then they meet up with Stu, right? And then mm -hmm. Stu and her start to develop feelings for each other, but they're not really open about it because they both know that Harold is this other factor there. But then you mentioned the diary. Um, Harold finds the diary and this is like a defining moment in Harold's character where he finds the diary and reads about how Fran is interested in Stu, but also how f frustrated and annoyed she was with Harold. And so this basically turns him into this person where he is pretty hateful towards them, but he decides to hide it and just patiently plot his revenge. Yeah. And, and that's where it really gets creepy with Harold mm -hmm. is like, that's going to be hurtful towards anyone, right? Like, yeah. You yeah. Know, if you find out the woman that you've you know fallen in love with feels some amount of animosity towards you and is in love with someone else, like that's going to take their toll on anyone. But the fact that he lets it fester to become this like outright hatred and develop this even more of, I don't know, almost like sociopathic tendencies of like, I'm going to, now I'm justified in doing whatever to yeah. anyone, you know, because, because I've been wronged in this way, then whatever I do from here on out is justified. Yeah. It's kind of like he, he's been holding back, like as much as he's constantly fighting this, I am better than other people because I'm smarter. And like, I know these things and like, I, you know, he's more capable in a lot of ways. He's also feeling this inferiority of, but also I'm like, so socially awkward and like, not like in the best physical shape, blah, blah, blah. And at this point, he's just kind of decides that he's not going to keep himself in check anymore. Like he's been jaded. So therefore he's living for himself and he's only really indulging those, I am better than everyone else um, thoughts that he gets. And this is, this is a moment that I think Stephen King does really well. It's kind of a similar moment to Larry and Nadine's later on where I don't think Fran did anything wrong by writing what she did in her journal. You know, she's expressing her feelings, but her expressing her feelings in an innocent way, her innocent action causes this, I don't know if causes, but is like the catalyst for this huge negative, like, uh, character choice for Harold, you know? Yeah. And I think a similar thing happens with Larry and Nadine. We'll talk about that later, but I just think that's so like so well done with the characters and the storytelling of like this character Harold that you I can totally understand his point of view. There's like parts where I'm reading Harold Harold and Larry where I'm like I I relate I feel like I relate too much to this character. Like I don't you know I don't want to be this character, but I think we've all felt that where yeah we felt like like we're looked down on even though we feel like wait, I, I have more value than I feel I'm being given credit for. And then, I don't know. So I was just so well done to see Harold, like you feel bad for him and you, you don't, he's not justified in his hatred towards them now, but you understand it. You totally understand it. I, I think in a way he's justified in his hatred towards them, but he's not justified in his like uh, evil actions that he plans taking yeah. from there on, you know? Yeah, I, I would say he's not justified in the hatred because he broke in to her private thoughts. You know, yeah. like it wasn't, these were not intended for him to read the way they were. Like if she wanted to express herself fully to Harold, it might've had the same effect, even if she expressed it in a, a more tactful way. But I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I, I guess, I don't know about hatred, but I can I, I can totally understand why he would be like, well, I'm not, don't want to be any part of these people yeah, anymore for sure yeah yeah for sure um and then yeah i don't know that was just such a great such a great moment and the build up to it the like of him like in her tent reading it was she asleep mm -hmm. in the tent at the time yeah like that's the thing is he didn't even care i don't think she was this i can't remember if she was asleep i think she was but he didn't care if she got, he got caught yeah he was, at, yeah. at that point he was like 
he's like yeah if i get caught then i'll just kill her and kill you know do whatever i yeah. need to and you know but um yeah such a so it was such a tense moment and an emotional moment it was really well done yeah and and then that um so at the same time everyone's having these dreams of the dark man randall flag and mother abigail and they're trying to meet up with Mother Abigail. They go to the CDC and they realize after meeting with Stu and going there that it's just a ghost town. And we can co- kind of cover that. Do, should we cover that now or when we talk to over Stu's part? Well, let's switch know. over to Stu's Stu yeah. part. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of put all the character endings. Okay, and talk cool. about them all yeah. together. So. Yeah, good idea. This book is hard to cover because you can't. Uh, yeah, it, there's just so much that it's it's hard to talk about. <laughs> it's, it's a huge plot and a huge cast of characters. And, yeah, and they're all yeah. intertwined. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Stu. Um, He's what, kind what of. Did the, you think of Stu? I I like Stu. He was just kind of. He wasn't super multi-dimensional. He was just who he yeah. was. But I I mean there there's lots of people like that. You know I think Stephen King did what he wanted to with writing, with creating and writing Stu. Yeah, Stu is kind of, um, he's not the most intriguing of Stephen King characters. I don't, I don't yeah. think he's a bad character, but there's not a lot of depth to him, like you said. Like he's, yeah. he's... When I say I like him, I mean, I like him as, a, as the person he is, but as an interesting character, he's not one of my favorite characters of the book. Yeah, by any it's, means. it's really interesting because there are some people in life that the more you get to know them, the more that you just, Gets to know them as the same person you already know, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And I yeah. feel like that's what Stu is. You know, he's a he's all an all around decent person that like lives his life in a pretty straightforward way and is, you know, yeah. just gonna do what he needs to be done. And that's kind of who he is, you know. Yeah, just like a, a small town guy, like it's probably his family's probably lived in that small town for a while. He grew up, there's a factory in town, that's where he worked, he hung out with his friends up until they all died from the pandemic and then he gets thrust into this um exciting adventure for him but but yeah but that's that's the beauty of stephen king is you he helps you see like that anyone can be a hero you know yeah yeah that's a really good point he isn't the most intriguing personality but that doesn't like he's thrown into these special circumstances where he can be a hero still Mm -hmm. and he doesn't the other thing is he doesn't do anything like particularly heroic, <laughs> heroic. I, yeah. can, I can never say that word, but yeah, he just kind of moves along doing what needs to be done, but nothing. Yeah. That was one thing I was a little disappointed with at the end, like the, the way he sat out the, the end of the book. I was, I thought he would do more. I thought, I thought a lot of people would do more at the end of the book, but him, especially he kind of just gets sidelined. Yeah. But, and fortunately for him yeah yeah fortunately yeah <laughs> um but yeah so he's kind of the the beginning of the whole pandemic kind of like we get the the intro chapter which i don't know if it's if it's in the non um uh unabridged version where there's this soldier who realizes a containment breach has happened at the like bio warfare department whatever base they're at and so the soldier tries to escape, gets his family, and ends up crashing his car into Stu Redman's friend's gas station. They're all hanging out there, and and yeah, and then so that's that's how Stu's introduced, and it's basically the whole start of the pandemic. So and interestingly, I think it was at Mellis Air Force Base, right? Is where it start, is supposedly started. It might have been. It might have, yeah, that would make sense because it said he came from Utah, right, from Salt Lake. No, N- Nellis. Oh, is... I thought you said Hill. I thought you said Hill. Never yeah. mind. N- Nellis is uh, outside of Vegas. I lived like 10 minutes or 15, um, 10, 15 minutes away from Nellis. Sorry, I thought yeah. you said Hill. I don't know. I don't know. But but outside Vegas. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and um, that, that part was emotional to me too, because he, like that soldier, you could tell he knew he was doing something bad, but he was just trying to protect his family. Yeah, because in his you mind, know. like everyone was going to be like screwed from it. So he had to try to do what he can to save his family. Whereas like his duty was, no, you should just die here in hopes that it doesn't and spread they, as much. They might have been able to contain it. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the crazy thing. And and I don't know how much of this conversation we want to have now, 
but this is when it starts to get really crazy for like what um the pandemic that we've been through. Uh, like yeah we can the, we can talk about this yeah yeah the outset of this book like you know i i kind of stopped following every little detail that came out about how it how covid could have gotten out of the lab from wuhan you know mm-hmm. um because it just got to be too much for me to really follow and i just was more yeah you know but it really was like could could they have you know shut things down before this got it got out of hand like what more could have been done could you know was it i i mean i don't want to get into conspiracy <laughs> theories here but like you know maybe it was a bioweapon yeah you know? like who knows and or they're working on something there i don't know like and this is not saying i believe any of that but like yeah. this this book makes you really been like I mean, are we naive, you know, to think that it, they, that there's no way that could have happened? Like maybe a little bit, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I would say we, we did want to kind of talk about the the comparisons to the pandemic we're in now to the book and surface level, but basically most, actually on most levels, the comparison just isn't really there. The, the Captain Trips uh, flu in the stand is so like contagious, and deadly that it kills off, like you said, like 99% of the U.S. population in the span of like a month. And mm-hmm. whereas COVID is contagious, you know, and it, it definitely is deadly and should be taken seriously, but it spreads so slow compared to the captain trips that we've been able to track so much more in real in the real life pandemic and see these things to try to stop it. Whereas in the book, it's before anyone really knew what was happening like society had collapsed and fallen apart. So the really only real comparison you can make, I would say is um, the fact that it was created in a lab in the book. And that was kind of a conspiracy theory that there is a center for disease or whatever, a lab in Wuhan. And like you're saying, like, are we naive to think that? I would not be surprised if that was the origin of the coronavirus, but like you said, I, I mean, there's no way to know at all, so it doesn't really matter. But it is interesting to, to think about. But yeah. that, not that it is what I think happened, but like if it came out that oh that did happen, to be like, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. exactly. And, <laughs> and um, I I do think that like the same that there were undercurrents of the conversation of like, oh, what more could the government have done? Yeah, you know, why yeah. didn't they do more? Why you know was this just an abject failure? on the government's part was it is there anything that they could have even done you know who knows like and i think that the book touches on those kind of conversations but like yeah. you said it moves on from like it just more takes this pandemic that killed 99.4 percent of the population as like a thing that happened you know it doesn't yeah that's not the really real story into, yeah. yeah that's not the real story um, I, which yeah made it more interesting i think but yeah i thought it would be more the story but I do like it is it's definitely more a post apocalyptic story than it is a story of living through a pandemic. Um, right. And I was looking to see parallels between, I mean, we have politicians and like media pundits now who like have become kind of, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I wrote it down because I couldn't think of how to describe this to myself, but um, uh, just kind of becoming like personalities around the whole virus. Like those who are like, like, like Fauci obviously and Trump have become big personalities on either side. And we don't really get this much in the book because it happens so fast. There aren't people who can say, this is what you should do. And then there's not time to say, oh, well, what you said wasn't like good choice or was a good choice you know either on either side of it in the book except for we do get a little bit of the look into like you said the military personnel and their reaction and it seemed like we can make kind of some comparisons there to like how has how has the u.s and other countries were based in the u.s so that's why we mentioned that but how how has the world in general the world leaders reacted to it the military leaders basically try to contain it and then once it was like okay you can't contain it it was just spread misinformation. Don't let the truth get out. Blame it on Russia. So we had like that's why some people called it the Russian flu, right? And and the book. That that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Like, like China virus versus the Russian yeah. flu. Like 
I, there, there were some things that I was like, that's kind of eerie, you know, yeah. like they, they, <laughs> they, that. Mentioned, they, mo- they mentioned Wuhan and, and the sand, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 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 Cause they, yeah, yeah. They Cause, did. Cause, Cause there they, is that, that center there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, because I, I saw that on you know social media of like oh yeah. Stephen King knew it was you know yeah <laughs> gonna happen. <laughs> but um, but that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, obviously, I, I mean, there's been misinformation uh, around the coronavirus in real life, but I don't think it's as bad as the book, at least publicly what we can see. Where in the book, there's generals who are just saying. Yeah, deny, 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 because they were the cause of it. The U.S. caused it in the book. Um, deny that it happened, that it even is a thing, suppressing the media. Um, those are kind of eerie things that, not that we've seen that happen, but that's kind of, I don't know, it's just political turmoil in general. And that was kind yeah. of <laughs> yeah eerie thing to read right. during election times. <laughs> but <laughs> it was, man, yeah, there, there were some things in the book that were like, I could see how that could happen, you know, yeah, like yeah. after w- living through it. And then other things like, I'm glad it didn't get this bad because, you know, yeah. We'll, yeah. Anyway. Anyways, moving on with Stu. <laughs> Stu. <laughs> yeah. So Stu's, Stu basically is the only one really to survive out of all of his friends who came in contact with it. And for that reason, the military tracked the guy who escaped and crashed in Stu's town and then saw that Stu was a survivor. So they just, took him to, I think the Vermont facility, it could be Virginia. I'm not really good with remembering words that have the same similar letters in them. Just, um, just ask Lloyd or Larry. Yeah, Lloyd and Larry, yeah, they come up later. <laughs> um, and then basically they're just doing tests on him to see why is he surviving when everyone else is dying? And I thought this was going to be like a happier time. I thought this was going to be like the cool, like, okay, here's the behind the scenes. Like this is back when I still thought the book would be more about living during a pandemic. So I thought this would be the point of view where they do the scientific test, kind of like uh, Andromeda strain. Have you seen that movie or read the book? Mm -hmm. It's a Michael Crichton story um, where there's this, I think it's like an alien virus that lands and the whole movie is about them testing it and trying to see, they only have two people who have survived from it. And so they're doing experiments on the people to see like, why did they survive to try to prevent it? So that's the kind of idea I I got from Stu's POV in the beginning. That's what I thought it was going to be. But then it just turned dark real quick (laughs) or they're just, we're going to kill you to just cover up evidence of this whole thing. Yeah. And that's the other thing you mentioned this real fast. There was never really any discussion on why the people that survived survived. Yeah, not at all. You know, uh, and I was kind of hoping that there would be, and I'm sure there, there's theories out there on the internet. I haven't really read them, but yeah. like, you, there's not really a lot in common amongst characters like that you could point to like, oh, it's this trait that they all have. I can I can just dis- discern anything. Yeah, I like, I mean, we kind of talked about this. The, the pandemic itself wasn't a huge, mm-hmm. yeah. it was a plot like device more than a plot point. Right. But like, if this would have been, again, like a Brandon Sanderson book, then at the end of the book, you'd be like, holy cow, I didn't notice this all along, but every character has X in common, which naturally allowed them to survive this flu. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I wouldn't be Stephen King's thing. Yeah. I guess I I don't know Stephen King well enough, but I guess I wouldn't have been surprised if there were clues throughout that I just missed. There there might be, there might be, you know, if, if you do know of this, then hop on discord and let us know. Let us know. Yeah. (laughs) But I honestly, I don't know really know what much more there is to say about Stu other than, I mean, after he escapes from that facility in a pretty cool way, that was kind of a cool action scene. Um, he meets up with Harold and Fran and his main point throughout the movie or not the, <laughs> throughout the book is basically he becomes Fran's love interest, which is this catalyst for Harold becoming mm-hmm. Harold. And so Stu throughout the rest of the book is just kind of a grounding force he doesn't really make plot important decisions in my opinion he's just kind of there not in a bad way at all but in in a good way in a way that's reliable like he yeah he doesn't freak out with uh, when fan tells it, him that she's pregnant like yeah he's he's a really stand-up guy and you, you get yeah that throughout the book yeah yeah but i don't know is there more you wanted to talk about with no, Stu? That's, that's kind of it i yeah. i was well, I guess we're doing full spoilers. So I was really happy that he made it back to Fran. Yeah, same, same. I would, yeah. You know? 
yeah, like we said, fortunately, he <laughs> was kind of set out the whole climax of the book. Yeah. But um, yeah, and then uh, we can talk about, let's talk about Nick and then, then Larry. I think Larry is like just behind Harold for me and like the most interesting character. But um, so Nick starts out, he's um, in the book, they say a deaf mute, but I think that isn't a um, accepted term anymore. He's, he's a deaf person. Um, yeah. Um, so, but basically that, that kind of defines his struggles is he communicates by writing on paper and he can read lips. So when he's looking at someone, you know, he can communicate just fine and understand. But he gets mugged at the beginning, and then through kind of a crazy twist of events, he becomes the sheriff's deputy of the town he got mugged in, <laughs> and then everyone dies while he's in charge of the the jail there. But this was just like this was one of those <laughs> plot lines where I'm like, dang, this is Stephen King doing Stephen King right now. Like this yeah. is just this is, um, you know, it was cool though. You, yeah, you really, I enjoyed it while I was reading it, but yeah. And, and you get like, again, that here's this good, decent person that's just getting hard knock after hard knock, you know? Yeah. But, but you know, he's a good person. His internal monologues of like, you know, what's kind of going on in his thought process, I mm -hmm. guess, were really interesting to me. Um, it was kind of sad yeah. that his character didn't get built up more later on, you know? Yeah, he kind of seemed, I mean, jumping head for a bit when they meet up with mother abigail who I haven't really talked about he's kind of seemed to be chosen as her like her peter like mm -hmm. peter the apostle and if like she's the the jesus figure of the story he seemed to kind of be like her like chosen disciple right but then once they all get to boulder and everything he's just kind of another one of the council he's not really a huge and even kind of on the on the journey there i feel like he stops getting as much attention you know yeah i feel like he starts off really strong and then just mm -hmm. kind of i don't know if maybe i wasn't completely engaged in a story but i just i didn't feel like a whole lot was added to his character throughout the book yeah yeah i think a lot like the best part of getting to know his character is in the beginning like with the mm -hmm. whole jail sequence and even that like isn't really called back to. I think like once he talks about how he doesn't want to be sheriff of their new town because he hated the responsibility of there's these people in the jail cells, they're dying, what do I do? And so he's like, that's not for me. But that's about the only real impact it has on his later development. Um, he is important in the fact that he meets up with Tom Collins. I think Tom Collins, I think, I think yeah. that's his name, uh, on the way. Um, trying to meet up with mother Abigail from their, their dreams they're having. And Tom is a, a some developmental delays. Yeah. He's got some, an intellectual disability. He doesn't really yeah. like go into specifics and, but he's probably, he's like, I imagine him like 20, right? Yeah. Something like that. Maybe 25. I really don't know. I could have all their ages wrong. I thought Stu was like 60 until him and Fran started to have. Oh, I think like, he was older. I, I pictured him in his 40s. 40s, yeah. Yeah, I, I like yeah. had to bring him down to like, okay, he's probably like 40. But yeah. at first, like he just sounded like an old man. But, um, but yeah, so Tom Collins um, has an intellectual disability and this kind of comes into play with the plot later. Uh, but they become companions once Tom realizes uh, that Nick is mute or deaf. Um, they figure out how to communicate and they start their journey. Um, I, I guess one of the only important things that happens on their journey to meet Mother Abigail is, um, or I guess we should say here, throughout the journey, all of our characters start to have dreams of Randall Flagg, the dark man who's giving them nightmares and Mother Abigail who is inviting them to her, her homestead in Nebraska. And she's definitely seen as a benevolent force in their dreams. And in the various groups of people traveling, um, they start to realize they're all having the same dream. And so they decide we should go meet up with Mother Abigail. Some a little more enthusiastic about it. Others, like Harold was definitely more skeptical about it um, along the way. But, but anyway, so, so as Tom and Nick are on their way there, they meet up with 
a girl named Julie, right? I think that's her name. Basically, this kind of had like a Walking Dead vibe to me where you meet someone in a post-apocalyptic area and you're like, oh, we could be like allies. And then you realize, no, there's crazy people out here. She tries to kill them. Mm -hmm. And then they run away from her basically. But yeah, I don't know if there's much more to say about Nick for now until we get to Boulder. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's about it. Yeah. So why why is Larry here? Larry to me, I, when I started reading it, I was like, Oh, Larry's going to be a bad guy. Like that's just like the kind of way he's introduced. He's a really good, great character. Um, When his friend slash fellow musician has to like sit him down at the party in the very beginning like dude look you're like you're just one of those people who's kind of a drain on everyone else and you need to like shape up like get out of here and learn to be a better person and not be like so I guess like kind of toxic he's kind of not in like a terrible way he wasn't like he's never introduced as like an evil bad person but just a more self-centered like he's selfish in the sense that that's just like where his mind is at but he's not trying to be selfish he's just someone who has to like make an effort to think about others in a way yeah um and i just thought like getting to know him more when he goes back to new york and is with his mom and his mom says you're a taker larry and just how that haunts him throughout the rest of the book i thought that was such a cool dynamic seeing this he becomes like one of the heroes and just seeing him constantly like doubting himself. I don't know if like, um, I don't know if it's like a, um, and what's imposter complex or something like that, but he just, he wants to be a better person, but every time he like slips up, he's just like, he's constantly getting down on himself. Like I'm just a taker. Like this is all like, I'm not good for anything else. And it's kind of parallels Harold's story Mm -hmm. a little bit in my mind. They're both kind of gray. And then Harold just decides, basically, I'm just going to be the taker. He's not a taker, but he's like, I'm just going to be this, like, prideful person. And whereas Larry is constantly battling, I don't want to be a taker anymore. And to me, that's why he's so compelling. Yeah. Larry is always battling against the darkness within himself. And Harold is always almost Harold's always almost kind of battling against the goodness of his nature. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a good way to put it. Like once he decides I'm going to be my own Harold and start my diary, anytime he has like a good thought, he's like, no, I need to squash that. Yeah. I didn't and think about what that. Was Harold's kind of classic line is pride, pride and selfishness are like the, the virtues that you want or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was like, you don't, he's like, don't change for society like pride is is like a a gem of a personality trait because it means you think society should change for you in this like twisted moral compass of his towards the end yeah but But anyway yeah larry's really good i the the catalyst of oh what's the woman's name he meets up with at the beginning that uh, oh yeah what was her name ah i can't remember let me let me see if i can find it um but anyways yeah just how yeah. like how she affects him later down the line well yeah and how she how her suicide mm-hmm. brings out like the kind of the best in him and i don't want to say like that that sounds bad but like yeah how he realizes that like man there are not very many people left and i need to do everything i can to yeah. help others you know rita that was her name rita rita yep yeah yep yeah, because he kind of, when he meets her, he kind of slips into the same, like, like we're having a good time together. He's like, not that he's using her, but he's definitely like, he's he's kind of a guarded person and like benefiting from their relationship in the ways he is without like making an effort really. And then her death definitely rocks him, like you said. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then from there, he kind of has like a mental breakdown for a bit up until he meets up with, Nadine and um, Joe. That's the kid's mm-hmm. name. So, yeah. yeah. So this was a really interesting dynamic between Larry, Nadine, and Joe. Mm-hmm. Like, you kept waiting for there to be more chemistry between Larry and Nadine. At least I did. Yeah, yeah. More romance mm-hmm. between them. 
but there wasn't really right like yeah it was like like to me it was like okay again like the fact that Harold and Fran are like the only like male and female together you just assume there's gonna be a romance like I assumed that with uh, Larry and Nadine and then I think the only development really is when they're together one time he said well, when oh, she oh go ahead well just like he's like oh i can tell she's like interested and then he made a move and then she rejected him and then he was like what but that was like the only real development to it and then it was just this thing knowing going forward that he was really into her but she wasn't willing to to play basically yeah and then until the end when she like tries yeah sleeping with him so that she yeah yeah um i thought that this was really interesting um, you kept, I kept kind of waiting for either Nadine to corrupt him or yeah. for him to save her. Yeah. And neither one of those things happen. Because, well, we almost get the saving moment in a weird way. Again, like this is a Stephen King weird way of the saving moment. But, um, but yeah, like, so they're all having these dreams to go to Mother Abigail and they're being tormented by the Randall Flag dark man dreams. But Nadine refuses to say she's having any dreams. And there's evidence that she is, but she's denying it. And you start to realize she's she's trying to follow the dark man. But yeah, I also expected her like to do something to corrupt the others, but it was more it wasn't like she she didn't really care about the dark man's mission. She was just, I am basically a, like, I just need to go find him and be his servant. Like that was her only yeah. motivation. It wasn't, it was just interesting how you think he would have tried to use her more to corrupt others, but it wasn't that way at all. Yeah. Which is kind of getting into Randall Flagg's character a little bit more. He's very uh, egotistical, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like he doesn't yeah. think that anything can go wrong. And so he's like, I don't need to corrupt people. Like people that are going to come to me are going to come to me. And that's the only people I'll need. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I, and I did I did like that she had the she was a good person in a lot of ways like she didn't she want was, to just yeah. abandon Joe like she wasn't this pure evil person she wasn't you know she wasn't it was like it was kind of the similar way she ha- she was like a good natured person her base personality was good she had to fight to she had to fight her good nature to continue yeah. on her mission from Randall Flagg and this was kind of a weird thing this is part of part of the more sexually explicit um, segments of the book. Um, basically, she had, I can't remember if she had had dreams from him for a while or if it was just from like the, the Ouija board type experience or what, but basically Randall Flagg, since she was like in high school, like marked her as like, you're gonna be my wife. So you can't be with anyone else. Yeah. And, and so that was like, she didn't really understand it, but that was kind of her life was based around that thing she just lived her life and was like waiting to meet this entity but kind of weird it's pretty creepy yeah it's really creepy and i and i get that it was supposed to be like this creepy thing but it's also kind of just like i don't know like weird this idea and and again this is it's meant to be weird to be creepy but the idea that she's like no you have to save yourself for this like this demon yeah this demon basically yeah i I don't know but her her back her story when you find out like the the college when she was in college and like the i don't know if it was a ouija board or if it was like something else where you actually write but basically the same idea that was that was like creepy i was imagining that like man when they do that in the tv show that's going to be like a creepy episode (laughs) but um yeah (laughs) But yeah, she's she's also an interesting character. I guess moving forward with Larry's plot, he he starts to after being spurned by her, they're still in this group. His group gets bigger and bigger, um, and he starts to kind of date this other girl, Lucy, who really likes him but knows that he is interested in Nadine. So it's kind of this weird love triangle. But Larry's constantly trying to become a better man. They travel, they meet up with Mother Abigail, and then. Um, and then they move to the Boulder Free Zone. Do we want to talk about anything else before we move to the Free Zone part of it? 
let's let's line up with the people that are traveling towards randall okay um, real cool. quick and yeah. then we'll talk about the boulder free zone versus vegas and kind of yeah wrap things up yeah because <laughs> we want it we need to get back um we need to get to yeah you're right yeah let's go so so starting with i guess lloyd lloyd yeah yeah there, there's not as many of these characters think yeah. like, kind of so lloyd um starts off as being this person that um he's stuck in jail for a crime that he like was a part of but you don't like a murder spree that he was a part of they were doing like a robbery and then yeah. his part well they had already it's kind of convoluted but they so, were hired to pretend to rob a friend of theirs and then they would split the cash with him later because he was robbing money that that guy had gotten from a mob boss or something but then they just realized oh we should just kill this guy anyways so they killed him and then they're on this like spree and then they go to rob someplace else for some reason and get in a gunfight and then there's a shootout but anyway pretty he's senseless. in jail yeah yeah he's in jail the whole pandemic happens he's like left he ends up like trying to eat rats and what you find out later is interesting because rats are like the part of how uh, randall flag like sees things happen mm-hmm. he also like eats part of his cellmate's leg you know and it's kind of like a little bit insane by the time Red yeah Lyle shows up yeah that really like affects his that makes him like more susceptible to randall flags yeah because he, he's already kind of admitted to himself that he's going to do anything he needs to stay alive is yeah he took that. yeah and he's and he's definitely ashamed of it so having someone save him from that situation he like like it's easier for him to devote himself to that person i feel like too but so he kind of becomes randall flags right hand man uh camp journey with him Mm -hmm. and you do he it's interesting because i feel like throughout the book you start to see him in a better light yeah you really do yeah he's not yeah he's like a senseless he does senseless acts of violence at times but he's not someone who is out to hurt other people in general like all the time yeah yeah it's really weird yeah, it reminded me of um, in Cold Blood. If you ever read that, I read that in high school. It's a true. Oh yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. 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 yeah, just that kind of. I read that both for the same class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Miss Fisher, English. Oh, I read for yeah for Adams. Anyway, yeah. Oh, um, shout out to our high school English teachers. Yeah, <laughs> but um, just this idea that there's these people who are, will are like able to do these horrific acts but then when they're not doing it there's not like they're like evil people all the time they're like fine people but have like no filter of like what is like terrible and what's not that's the kind of feeling i got from lloyd like yeah he'd be fine like oh yeah i have to go kill a bunch of people let's do it i'm not going to be like happy about it but yeah this is what we got to do but yeah um and his character does stay interesting especially when people from you know the spies show up and you can yeah. get a different look at him like i feel like that's when i was most interested in his character yeah um but other than that he's just kind of sticking palling around with randall flag yeah i i liked um another randall flag uh crony kind of trash can man mm-hmm. basically his summary is he's just this pyromaniac from a small town in i think iowa or indiana or something and he just likes to let things burn. So he's just been burning things and without going into too much detail because his story is the one with uh, sexual assault in it. Um, basically, Randall Flagg manipulates other people around him to kind of like shoe and lead um, Trash Can Man to him, again, to make Randall Flagg seem like he's saving him from a terrible life. And so Trash Can Man gets to Vegas when Lloyd's in charge and you get to see Lloyd kind of like, kind of take him under his wing, you know, like, oh yeah, like here, we'll show you the ropes. Here's some food. Like they were all nice to each other at Randall mm-hmm. Flag at in Vegas with Randall Flagg's commune there, which was interesting to see. You'd think it'd be like, like uh, Mordor with all the orcs, like fighting each other and like yeah. killing yeah, each cool. other. Like, <laughs> yeah. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. <laughs> but nothing like that happens. You know, they're more like 
they do brutal things to each other, but it's like, you know, this is what we need to do to keep an orderly society. That was it, you know? Yeah. But I, I think that part yeah. also made me think Lloyd is like, oh, you're a better person than I thought. And the, the other thing with Trash Can Man is he has like this uh, knack for sensing out where all the weapons are stored. Yeah, was that? where? Yeah. Is that supposed to be, because I'm, I'm new to Stephen King, this whole, um, like I have some experience with like magical realism in general, but was that supposed to be a supernatural ability or? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I, I didn't know so. if it was just supposed to be like, oh, he had a knack for it or like, I don't know how Stephen King books really Steve, go. Stephen King's magic system, it's called like Ka is kind of like the underlying thing. Mm-hmm. And it, there's a lot of things like, like you see Carrie, who's like a tele or yeah, telekinetic, yeah, yeah. you know, um, versus like Mother Abigail, who is more telepathic. Yeah, you know, and so so it's kind of the just shine. Different. Yeah, the shine. Yeah, the shine. Yeah, yeah. and then you have uh, oh, what's dang the kid from The Shining? I forget Jack. His name. No, yeah. Jack's the dad. No, Jack's the guy. Uh, oh, dang. I don't remember. Anyway, I've only yeah. seen the movie. I haven't read that book but so yeah so he has kind of a supernatural knack of finding weapons explosives basically anything that he would like to make things explode with (laughs) yeah yeah um and that's kind of there's not too many other people that we see like journeying to vegas right yeah everyone else is basically a side character um i guess probably the next big one who's part of the stand at the end would be ralph and glenn bateman but they're more side characters than anything. I don't think you ever get a POV from them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're Glenn Bateman. He's he's uh, met along the way with Stu and Fran. And then Ralph is Ralph was part of Nick's crew, I think, originally, something like that. But but they're both going from the free zone to yeah Vegas. to Vegas at the end. Yeah yeah. But uh, so I guess we can go back to basically a bunch of the groups meet up at mother abigail's right and then they move from there that she says we need to move to boulder to confront the basically make a stand against um the vegas crew randall flags crew to be closer to them and then other people who are still on the road realize this through the visions and they all meet up in boulder and they establish the boulder free zone which is basically the new center of the United States, I guess, like, yeah, new America. So, I, so first of all, this, this book felt like it should have been a trilogy. Like it really did, you know, yeah, with like yeah. the first book being everybody journeying. And then the second book being the free zone. And then the f- third book being the stand, you know, that's mm-hmm. kind of how I thought. Yeah. My mind. But I was happy that they actually took the time to like establish this new order of society, you know? Yeah. It, it didn't really, like plot-wise, it wasn't super important. There were important parts to it for sure. Like you get to see Harold's machinations and- mm-hmm. This and, is when Harold like really de- de- yeah. declines into like insanity. Yeah, but other than that, like all the minutia of how are we going to set up a new government? It, it never got boring for me, but I could see if people weren't as, enjoying the book as much being like, what's the point of this? Like, right. especially how it ends, it's like this- I guess it's kind of important still. Like this is how they established a new society. I thought that was all interesting though. Just the idea of like, how would you start from the beginning? And I, I read a quote from Stephen King where he said, he got to this point where they're establishing the new society. And he was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know where this book is going. I don't know what to do with it. He kind of had writer's block until he came up with the idea of blowing up half the council. <laughs> And then he, he was like, that's what saved the book, that idea, which I was like thinking about that. That makes sense. Like that was a good way to like propel the plot forward again, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Maybe that's anyways. Scary. So yeah. And once they're in the Boulder free zone, I guess the, the most important things that happen are Harold descending into his, his madness and. And becoming like a real sociopath or psychopath. Yeah. I don't, like yeah. where he's, pra- he has to practice like smiling in the mirror yeah and everyone talks about how he's always smiling but it's like you can tell it's yeah you can tell it's not a real smile so so one part is when um they really liked was when larry wanted to meet harold you know yeah yeah that was such a cool yeah to see harold's reputation through somebody else's eyes yeah you could really see what harold could have been and should have been if he yeah better i'm glad you brought that up because that yeah that was so cool because 
again, not that I think Fran did anything wrong because when you are like when you're around someone all the time, even though she could see his, his like shining qualities, his negative qualities kind of suffocated her from seeing all that. But Larry had this cool perspective of just seeing this brilliant person, just seeing his positive attributes of being this brilliant person who was able to basically, he was the reason all of Larry's group got to where they needed to go because he like left all these directions and Anyways, that was really cool. It made me think kind of of uh, Speaker for the Dead, if you read that, just the idea of getting to know somebody like completely and not having these like blinders up that Fran kind of had. Not like, I mean, she got to know a different side of him. I guess Larry really had the blinders up because he didn't see the negative side. But They both had blinders up. That's, yeah, the, that's the thing. Yeah, is they both yeah. felt like they knew him completely and utterly enough yeah. to like put their life in his hands but neither yeah. one of them really knew him at all. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And it was cool that scene where he's like, I want to see Harold. And Fran was like, why would you want to see Harold? Like she yeah. was like, what? And he was like, what's wrong with you? Like this guy like saved us basically. But I mean, obviously Larry meets him and then realizes there's something off, but if he had met him before his dissension, maybe he could have been a, like an anchor to help Harold, like, Harold would probably parts of himself. Yeah, exactly. And like gain that confidence to not care what other people thought as much, but yeah, yeah, that was, that was um, a really cool part. That's, that's great writing right there. This is when the payoffs happen of taking, yeah. you know, a thousand pages, right. To get yeah. to that moment of like, Holy cow. Yeah. He would think that, you, you know, like, and, and that it was done so well. Yeah. It makes, it makes me think like, what do, like, I, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of how, like, my close friends and family view me, but, like, how do these other people who have met me on, like, one-off occasions or through other people, you know, how do they see me, like? Or, or, or like, somebody at work that you just, like, email, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's even, yeah, probably pretty negatively. <laughs> like, when, <laughs> oh, hey, come on, Jake. Well, well, just because, and probably see my my work more negatively because most people we interact with are people we are investigating and saying hey you owe this money and so it's constantly like hey you still owe this money so that's probably not like they're seeing that negative side whereas the client we're working for they see the positive side of hey here's all the money we got you back (laughs) you know (laughs) but um but yeah just interesting to to think how how multi-dimensional people are and he really focuses like he really hits that point home stephen king does with writing yeah. that whole interaction. Yeah, it, it was yeah. it was really good. Yeah. Um, and here, I guess they start, they make their counsel and everything. And um, probably my big, the biggest thing I'd want to talk about now is Nadine um, mm-hmm. in the Boulder Free Zone. And again, a perfect, like almost a perfect scene as weird as it is. Like Nadine had been saving herself for the this evil demon basically and then she realizes she wants to break free and such a good duality of her moment of trying to break free is also larry's moment of like cementing in no i'm going to be a good person i'm going to be this changed person who isn't a taker so basically she goes up to larry and says like hey if you want me take me now like i'm i'm good to be with you i want to be with you but larry had been dating lucy for a while and so in Larry's mind, it's this decision between staying with Lucy and committing to her or just being a taker again, using like using people just for what he wants, even though there's a better option out there. But for Nadine, it was, this is a way to escape the dark man's control. Not that she- well, so, so I feel like there, there was a line in the book. I think it was Mother Abigail that said it, but um, he was like, oh, she offered to herself to him after it was too late joe like it says way... it yeah oh, joe, joe says, says it. It. Yeah, yeah 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 so yeah, yeah. it was yeah so it was she not... was doing it to try and like justify to herself that she was doing what she could to like yeah. not go bad but yeah she already really knew in her heart that like he wasn't going to take yeah her. that's that's true but it so like she wasn't being completely honest in her effort i guess to be to redeem but herself i think she was desperate she she was like doing it out of desperation, knowing that it wasn't going to be enough, but like needing to like desperate enough to try it, you know? Yeah. 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 
Uh, but still, just the the duality there of yeah, the decision that Larry made that like cemented him in, in his growth and change as becoming a better person caused not that it caused like Nadine had her her choice, but was also a decision that led to Nadine fully accepting the Dark Man, joining with Harold and plotting and ending up killing half of like the heroes we knew at the time. Yeah. But, All right. So, so let's briefly mention that. Yeah. So if it's been a while since you read the book, Harold makes a bomb, Nadine, they go set it up at a town meeting. Yeah. Nick, like they're all, they're all getting these like kind of psychic impressions that something bad is going to happen. At the same time, mother Abigail is coming back from like, she, Oh yeah. She kind of disappeared. We forgot to mention that she kind yeah. of left everybody. Once the free zone camp got up and running, she just pieced out of there. Um, and then, so she came back to so everybody left the building and then Harold, blew up a make, makeshift bomb that he had made, killed Nick and other some people, other people. Yeah, I don't remember. It was like the biggest one. Yeah. Um, hurt Fran, hurt, yeah, Fran, right? Hurt Stu and Fran, I think. Hurt Stu and Fran. Or Larry, I don't know. Fran yeah, got, Fran got like hurt. a couch thrown on her, but she was, ended up being, oh no, yeah, she was, she was hurt pretty bad. She was in the hospital and then mother yeah. Abigail heals her. Yield her, and that's yeah. what convinced Stu to go. Okay, so now we're moving yeah. towards the end game. So yeah. Stu, uh, let's see if let's see if we can get the four people that went on the mission: Stu, Larry, Ralph, Larry. and Glenn, Glenn Bateman. Yeah. I yeah, yep. I could be saying Ralph's name wrong. I think it was Ralph, but okay, yep. yeah. So they they all go, um, and Mother Abigail tells them to go journey to Las Vegas. And they're going to be the people that stand against. Yeah, it doesn't give any any like direction, like how take, to fight take, or if they yeah. should fight or what. It says take the clothes on your back. Don't take any. You have to walk. Yeah, right? you have to walk. And she gave these very yeah Old Testament vibe yeah. instructions. To yeah, them, for sure. Right? You know, go out into the wilderness. Take the clothes on your back. You have to leave tonight, today, or tomorrow. You know, and just go. And I don't, I can't tell you if you're going to win or if you're going to come back or what, but you just need to do this. Right. Yeah. And her, her whole story is basically, she brought them to her. She's a really interesting character. I loved getting her like backstory, like in the chapter. There's that one chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Where you get like basically her whole childhood and like the history of her and her family and everything. But basically she's like, always been like pretty devout to the God she believes in. And it's kind of vague whether like that kind of God exists in the world, but definitely there is some benevolent force that is guiding her because she's receiving guidance. Mm -hmm. But in her pride of, she got too prideful about the Boulder free zone whatever she was chastised and told she had to go wander in the wilderness and she refused to confront nadine was the big oh one. that was it yeah she could yeah. she could tell nadine was had a major dark man influence and yeah so she, yeah you're right she had her a little bit of um you know not doing exactly what was right going on but let's talk about randall now like yeah he was pretty much not even a character throughout most of the book right yeah but then you get like full on craziness. In so the crazy. Last act of this book. Like, yeah. um, you see how he is like super powerful. Like he can shape, shape shift. He can like influence people to basically do anything he wants. You know, he's like mm -hmm. supernatural powers galore, but he's like crazy, you know, yeah, he's like, unstable. Yeah. I was so surprised. Like he seems so cool, calm and collected in the beginning like when you get like little glimpses of him and his plan. Mm -hmm. And then the more you see him, like his whole interactions with Nadine when she gets to him and just how he's just erratic. She's able to provoke him to basically kill her, to put herself, put her out of her misery. And I don't know, he's just like not stable. At that point I was like, oh, you're easily like, easily de defeated defeated yeah gonna be defeated here i wasn't sure how at all but i was like you're, you're not this like i don't know you know lannister in your <laughs> grand schemes no he's the opposite <laughs> of a lannister yeah he's more of a but, bolton but yeah <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> yeah but but you really do get that he is um like super powerful but not but you 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 get that the actions of normal people like frustrating him drive yeah. him more and more insane yeah you and know? like little little things obviously that would frustrate people but like they affect him so crazily and you see the same thing um i guess mild spoilers for it and even if you haven't read the book, like it's in the movies, yeah, yeah. But like you get these small little acts of heroism, right? That, like, are really what's able to defeat, you know, the the force and it. It's like it can't comprehend being challenged or like things yeah. not going the way that they want them to. And so, uh, and like speaking of Randall balls. Flag and it, yeah, um, yeah, and you kind of see it when he finds out Trash Can Man goes on a little spree of blowing up, kind of sabotaging <laughs> the Las Vegas crew's um, operation. They were trying to get fighter jets up and running to nuke, or I don't know if nuke or just bomb. Um, yeah, I think they were pull the gonna... free zone. But he, he kind of has a, a mental breakdown himself, Trash Can Man, when he starts blowing things up. And then he's like, oh, I need to make this up somehow. But anyways, yeah, so he, you see Randall Flagg kind of like, his sanity slipping and kind of skipping ahead. Stu breaks his leg on the way there and gets kind of waste like waylaid and he's hanging out with uh Kojak, the coolest dog I've ever read about. Coolest dog. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, so there's a scene where Stu um Stu tells Kojak to fetch wood for firewood, and he says fetch. Kojak brings him the wood and then he grabs it and says, fetch again. He brings him more wood. And I have a dog who loves the fetch and she would, she'd be like, I'm not going to fetch until you throw the stick. I got you. Like, there's no way she would go get more sticks. She'd be like, throw the one I got you. So if my dog Rocky were in Kojak's position, I would die. That's what, I, <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to Kojak. But anyways. Um, yeah. <laughs> Stu's, yeah. Kojak is awesome. Stu's there. And then um, Larry. And, and, and let me just say one thing about yeah. Stu breaking his leg. Like the brilliance of Stephen King is you don't know if that was just going to be like literally the last chapter you read about Stu in. Yeah. You know, you could just like, oh yeah, he's dead. You know, like he could have done that, right? Because he says things like, and that was the last time they saw him. Yeah. And then you're like, wait, does that mean he's dying or they're dying? Or, or yeah. yeah, or both. <laughs> or both. Yeah. And, or yeah. So that, that's the brilliance of Stephen King is he just, um, the plot is unpredictable enough that like, you don't know what you can't predict what's going to happen with that. Yeah. You know? Which probably has to do with his writing style of more just letting these characters grow in their, yeah. in the situation they've been put in. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So then we get um, the rest of the crew or the, um, so he breaks his leg on the way. The rest of the three people keep going on foot and um, them going on foot gives trash can enough time to go get the nuke yeah to, um to bring back to las vegas um glenn is the one that gets shot in the jail cell right yeah he does a good job of making um randall flag even crazier as well just his he was He's like laughing. so yeah so calm and just like oh you're pathetic like you're we were so scared of you and you're this unstable man like why are we scared uh, there there's there's a, i really like glenn i'm i'm sorry for uh people that aren't Christian, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about how when people see the devil, they're just going to laugh at how kind of pathetic he is. Oh, uh, yeah. Isaiah. Yeah. And that's kind of how, um, how it felt like, you yeah. know, Glenn seeing, yeah. you know, Glenn seeing uh, Randall. And that drives Randall to like, uh, be like, okay, well, what the other two, we're going to like show them, you know, yeah. they kind of uh, get people prepared to like quarter them only with cars. And th this mm -hmm set up like um kind of makes me think of something from uh what's that show the post-apocalyptic show with water where they're all fighting mad max just, oh mad just max, like maybe yeah. like yeah. Mad, mad max vibes where everyone's gathered yeah. together and they're gonna like you know do something gruesome yeah for sure um i think like this is a good these are good moments for lloyd and larry Lloyd mm -hmm. kind of, uh, Glenn tried to bait Lloyd into shooting Randall Flags and like, shoot him. Like he's pathetic, like just shoot him. And Lloyd just cements his loyalty. Just like, no, I owe my whole life to, 
to Randall Flagg, basically. I can't do this. And it, it, the thing was, and that's it, it was another one of those like impetuses where he, he realizes that he's on the losing side. Like he realizes yeah. that Randall is like, but he crazy. still did. Yeah. But he would, but what, I mean, what's he going to do? Like, yeah, he could still kill him really easily. So, but it, it, it did a really good job of showing like how pathetic he was, you know, and, and mm-hmm. the, the people closest to him realizing that, you know, yeah. man realizing that. Yeah. It, it, although he remained loyal, he definitely saw through the facade of this great leader and just like, oh, you're just as broken as like the rest of us. I did like mm-hmm. the part where Glenn kept telling him to shoot him and Randall was like, well, shoot one of us. Like, <laughs> like he was, <laughs> he was like, shoot me or shoot. Yeah, <laughs> just shoot one of us or something. But, um, and then Larry just, I thought this was like a sad but fitting ending for him. Like he's able to go out like such a true hero, like having made the changes in his life that he wanted to in his person and like basically died like a brave hero with with the nuke going off there. Yeah, and exactly what you're saying. Like he was portrayed as a taker, but, and then he gave, everything yeah for, and for, for no glory either and that yeah. was another thing where he was like a rock star right but now he's yeah. just like he's still kind of on a stage for everybody to see and he didn't do anything like particularly brave except yeah. for show up except for like decide okay i'm gonna follow what this old lady told me and yeah like, he, didn't, he didn't he didn't like fight or anything you know like that no. you'd assume like a hero would do but he just yeah. went and stood in the cage and that's what gathered everybody together and gathered, you know, and got uh, Randall to show up and bang, bang, bang. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He starts doing like, this is one thing out of both the Stephen King novels I've read. I'm kind of disappointed in the climaxes. They just happen so quickly that I don't feel like, I don't know. I'm expecting there to be this more protracted like sequence and it's more just boom, boom, boom. It's done. And so like, I thought there'd be like, some sort of battle of some sort between yeah. the four that were sent and Randall Flagg. And then like when he, they're in the cages, I was like, maybe Larry's going to like get some sort of escape and then force Randall Flagg to stay there and die. But instead they're just in the cages and trash cam man says, here I am with my nuke. Like this is my new offering. And then Randall Flagg's like, Oh shoot, here comes trash can man. Let me throw my ball of fire at him. It was pretty intense yeah. when he started using the ball of fire and like killing people with it. Cause there were some defectors who wanted to go away. Yeah. Like that was, that was like, Oh, this is kind of creepy. But then it ends like, like as soon as it was like getting really cool. But, yeah. And that, that is my main thing with it, It's just like Stephen King and Brandon Sanderson are just opposites. opposites in so, yeah. so, so many ways where St- Sanderson has the 300 page Sander Lanch at the ending of yeah. his epics and yeah. Stephen King has like a you know and they're both good right but like they just don't focus on the same things and yeah, yeah this is where it, it just to my liking Stephen King I I just never love his endings you know yeah and this is another ending that it's just like I like the falling action this actually yeah. has more falling action than most of his books have the fall yeah the falling action was good um it was just that bit of the climax itself where I was hoping for a little more I mean not that not to say a nuclear explosion is a good <laughs> climax to a to a book, but I was I don't know hoping for more meat there. But yeah, so that's how. And then so Stu sees that from the distance. We didn't really cover this, but just to wrap the book up plot wise, he meets up with um, Tom Collins, who's on his way back from spying, and they. Yeah, we completely forgot about the yeah uh, the well, spy plot line, but. That, that was um, one of those things that could have just been cut out in my opinion. Yeah, and it didn't really, like they made a big deal about Tom being the spy. And it was a big deal in the sense that it kind of showed, or it wasn't a big deal, it was a deal. It showed Randall Flagg wasn't omnipotent. He didn't know who the spy was. And Lloyd was like, if you had like trusted me, I could have found this spy for you forever ago because he had information, you know. But so it kind of showed the weakness of Randall Flagg there, but the spies themselves didn't do anything. One was killed before they, he even got there. The other was like known to be a spy pretty much the whole time by Randall Flagg and she was gotten rid of and then Tom escaped. But him spying didn't do anything. 
his only yeah. his only like pro of being there and spying was he was able to save Stu on the way home, and kind of show. I think it kind of contributed to, I think it contributed to Randall's like breakdown and yeah, yeah, slip through the cracks. But I mean, the spying itself, it's not like, oh, good thing we sent a spy for this information. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, anyways, they get home. Fran has her baby, and it looks like the human race will continue with immunities, um, et cetera. Um, Yeah. You get a a post credit scene of Randall. Oh, yeah. That and so my question, having not read the Dark Tower, and I don't know if this is spoilers, so if it is, um, I won't answer. If it's maybe don't answer, but I kind of I couldn't tell if he was like this demonic force that possessed different like human bodies, like human people, or if he was the same person who was kind of indestructible. Like when he woke up on the beach, at first when I read it, I read it as like, oh, he had just possessed the body of one of the people who lived there. But now I'm like, was it or was it his like actual person? Because he talks yeah. about these like past lives and memories he's had. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't want to answer this wrong, so okay. I'm just gonna punt it. It's kind, of, and to my knowledge, he's kind of like Pennywise, where he he can kind of take whatever form he wants. I okay, but I don't know. Like he's definitely like a big. I don't know. Go go read on. Well, if you're on the wiki, you'll get spoilers. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about this more in Discord. Yes, yeah. you know, because there's people that yeah. do a better job answering. Um, one thing I think was cool about him with the spy stuff is this is like a good, it was kind of like a cinematic scene of when he sends his people to capture the judge, but they accidentally kill the judge instead, who is going to be mm-hmm. a spy. And then him turning into a wolf and eating his. Um, his like crony who's messed up like that was like i was like okay i can see this being like an ep like in part of an episode of the series and being like really creepy and, and, and this is when you remember that stephen king is a horror author yeah 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 the, most of this book it doesn't really feel like it but there's moments where you're like oh yeah 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 well, one last note kind of wrapping things up this is a classic american book right i'd say yeah it, but um I think a lot of people going into Stephen King have this idea that he's like philosophical in his books and he has philosophical moments, but there's also a lot of like uh, moments of like vulgarity. And I yeah. don't just mean that in terms of like the language that's used, mm-hmm. but like it's, it's uh, there's a lot of baseness in his books. Too. Yeah. Like of the violence and like the, just, I don't know. Yeah. And, and, uh, one YouTube video I watched on this um, to kind of like review talked about how much he like uses the word like urine and like talks about peeing. Yeah. You know? And, and, and really? it's always that adds, but in, in other ways, like um, it, and you kind of, Stephen King gets lumped in rightfully so as one of the best like American authors, uh-huh. but then sometimes his works are like talked about like Tolkien's are in some ways you know about how he like wanted this to be like the fellowship of the ring and like they're not, not really yeah they're not like i having read that i think i saw that quote halfway through reading it and i was like looking for more similarities and it's just the fact that it's an epic journey like that's the only real right. comparison well and just i mean with there are cool insights that you can pull from his work that we've talked about i think we've talked yeah. about a lot of them but like he's not there giving like philosophical diatribes in his oh works. yeah not like at all pretty pop poppy like pulpy works yeah you know what i mean yeah. yeah the characters are where from my opinion so far especially with the stand i can't really remember from um pet cemetery how well, much pet cemetery like that that is his scariest book in my opinion because i have a toddler having a like, kid yeah yeah like it's that has terrified me more than any by far more than any book mm. you know i've read by him that one was definitely more, it felt like more, this is just going to be a horror book. Whereas the stand had was more about, these are these characters and that's where his strength is to me. Not so much a philosophical like diatribe, like you said, but just these interesting characters and their choices and the fact that you can relate so well to what they're doing. And just, it makes you kind of sit back and think like, like how am I as a person? And how can I learn from this? And then how can I learn to view other people differently? based on yeah. this as well. I think that's probably one of the biggest strengths of his of this book. 
yeah and just with accessing the like we we were talking about the heroism and and all of us and like random people and i mean i think we mostly write read like epic fantasy that Mm -hmm. has um more characters that are different than regular people you know yeah it's more like that's more fantasy fantasy whereas this like feels a little more real yeah exactly yeah and so and, and I, I know that there's like a whole another genre that does this. Like I grew up, I, I really liked Dean Koontz growing up. Like when I was a teenager, I read a bunch of Dean Koontz and Dean Koontz kind of does a similar thing where it's yeah. based in our world, but, but actually like basing things in our world really does. Actually, this isn't, if you notice, like this isn't Earth Prime in the Stephen King universe. This is like, um, <clears throat> it's anyway. supposed to be different. How, should I pick yeah. something up on that and in, in the stand? Uh, just like there's some different sodas that aren't, aren't like real sodas that are mentioned like there's some brands that aren't real brands uh, that he like made yeah. up you know which um I, all, the only uh, brand i remember is payday <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but um anyway in, in kind of the stephen king multiverse this isn't mm-hmm. earth prime like our yeah. earth, there's an earth prime in the multiverse and this yeah it, but yeah interesting but yeah, definitely. Um, I want this is something I wanted to bring up. Um, this whole uh, it's like part of the genre of magical realism, right? Where it's basically like ninety percent is normal, and then you get that ten percent of like supernatural and paranormal going in there. Um, and I think this book does a really good job of incorporating that because when a society falls apart with such a cataclysmic event as a pandemic to this degree um, in the stand. I feel like it'd be easier for people like they'd be so unsettled already to just accept like I guess I'm having visions now in my dreams and we're all having these shared yeah. dreams like I think it'd be easier to accept that it felt like more like I mean the world's such a crazy place already like I can accept these like paranormal aspects to it without like there wasn't that much suspension of belief there for me yeah for sure I mean look if I was one of the 0.5 or point yeah, yeah, whatever it is. Point oh, yeah. If I was that one of the very few people remaining, and I started having dreams about going to Boulder, I'd go to Boulder. Or yeah. Going to, to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What else are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess like just to kind of wrap it up. Um, one of the last things I want to talk about is, are there anything? Um, since we have the TV adaptation now, are there any things that you're like that you've thought this will need to change for the TV adaptation or? these are things that are really shine in the TV adaptation. Yeah. Um, Other than just condensing it, I guess. Because it's, yeah. Condensing it, which they're definitely doing in the TV they adaptation. Are. Yeah. Yeah. Are they going, yeah. I wonder, um, I uh, thought like, I wonder if they'd even go to Nebraska, the Boulder or if it would yeah, just no, be they, one, yeah. one journey they're to so, wherever it is. So <clears throat> I don't know how much you want to but, spoil but the TV we, show. Let's but yeah, let's not spoil saying, the TV yeah. show, but um, they're condensing that, it. That um, this is like a minor part, but I thought it was interesting. Um, if I'm correct, the actor who portrays Larry Underwood is black, right? In in the yeah. TV show, that was an interesting choice to me because kind of part of Larry's taker, like this, uh, like his internal demon saying you're just a taker. They talk about since he sings like R and B music in the book they kind of talk about how he's kind of culturally doing cultural appropriation. Like they talk about how he sounds like, like a black man when he sings and he's like, Oh, that's just like the style. And it's to me, that was like part of his characterization of just one more aspect of him just taking. And, and then I thought about all the racial remarks there are in the book. There aren't a ton, but it's like casually there. And that was one thing I'm like, with the casting choice differently, I wonder if they just kind of remove the aspect altogether. But well, I don't no, know. He's he's still portrayed as being a selfish person. No, not that part. Just the the but, racial part of it, and yeah. like the racial, because people are like judge him yeah. for for singing music that is associated with African Americans in a like a derogatory manner in the books. In the book, I mean. Yeah. And I wondered. I'm like, they probably just wanted. Yeah, to it seems like that that's a plot that yeah that's kind of taken out. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's modern day. This, yeah. So, so um, and I'm not saying that there's not still racism in modern day, but not like, the same way I, though. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he does an amazing, he, he's the highlight mm-hmm. of the show so far for me. Is, yeah, I'm is really there. excited. Um, 
I was, yeah, I was just interested about that. Cause like I said, it wasn't a big plot point. So it doesn't like, it doesn't affect yeah. that at all, but I, that was just an interesting no. um, part there. And then I don't know, I'm just really excited for them to nail the, the creepiness of it, of like seeing people descend into yeah. like into being more evil and then the Randall flag moments to make that really creepy. Honestly, I feel like the book wasn't as creepy as I wanted it to be. And so I think TV is a better medium for me to be creeped out. So I'm excited to see that. Yeah, I, I, there, there's only two episodes and I, have, I haven't just, my thoughts generally about the show, I haven't been blown away from it, but it okay. was like a 5.2 on IMDb. Which oh, like, really? Yeah, which I think it's much better than that. Like, hmm. I, I've, I've enjoyed it. And yeah, we'll have to do a review of that once we, yeah, we finish it. Once the whole, the whole thing comes out. Yeah. Anyway. Anyways, but, well, yeah. um, did you, is that about it? Or do you have um, anything else you wanted to add? That, that's it for me. I, I mean, look, this is a hard book to talk about. It's a hard yeah. book to cover. It's a hard book to develop into an ad- adaptation. Mm-hmm. Like there's just a lot going on in this book. It really should be a trilogy. Like we could have talked about this in several episodes, but yeah, it would have been interesting. Best. Would have been interesting to see if he could have expanded it into a trilogy. He could have. Uh, I mean, it's as long as a trilogy. It yeah. Could have been, you know, three novels. Um, I still stand by my rating. Uh, eight, yeah. eight out of 10. Definitely recommend if you, I mean, obviously if you're listening to this, you've already read it, but I think the strong points are the characters. If you're doing a reread, focus on the characters. I think that's where you're going to get the most enjoyment out of it. Um, but yeah, um, thanks for listening to this episode of Phantology. You can find us and more of our content at www.phantologybooks.com. Um, we also have a Discord. The link is in the description and on our website. Please join. Uh, we love the discussion. We are very much amateurs in the in the sense that we love to read books and review them, but we're not experts at it. So join, uh, join the discussion, help us learn more. We love to learn together. And check out our merch. Also, um, like to highlight uh, the charity book for prisoners. It's a great way to reduce recidivism and it's a charity we really like to support. So. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks that, Jake. Yeah. Signing off. See you guys. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Phantology. If you'd like to let us know your opinions on all things sci-fi and fantasy, join our discord. Invites are in the episode descriptions below. If you'd like to support the show, like these fine folks here, you can do that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. Patrons get early access to new episodes, exclusive postings, and exclusive Discord benefits. But of course, just listening and watching and sharing with your friends and family is support enough. Journey before destination all.